All right, it's two o'clock. Gail told me to start right on time, so that's what I'm gonna do. Hi, Gail. Uh, welcome to the alternative, the alternative jazz venues, Gail's site, and uh, I wanna thank Gail right off the bat for uh, putting this together, especially in, in these times where we can't be together like we, we want to be. Um, I'm assuming you can all hear me. I'm hoping you can. Uh, so what a loyal community of music lovers and supporters. And thank you again, Gail, for creating this situation for us. I'm, okay, cool. Now I see you. I guess people can hear me. Uh, I'm John Beasley, and I'm a, I'm a musician, a composer, an arranger, pianist, chief bottle washer and cook, mu musical director, and uh, lately I am constantly reminded of, of how being a human being comes into play of being a musician and just being an all-around person because now we have all this time to really reflect on who, who we are and how we want to be uh, as people and as society. And I think jazz is a, an incredible metaphor for this because it, it means playing together, uh, being open to somebody playing a different chord or a different note, changing tempo, a different groove. That's what, that's what all this is all about in communication. You know, Miles always said jazz is social music. So here we are, we're dealing with COVID and um, this is gonna be sort of a, an audio memoir because I have no ambition to write a memoir. Um, so here we go. I'm gonna use my new record, uh, Monkestra Plays John Beasley, as uh, sort of an outline to kind of tell my story. The record comes out Friday the 21st, which is this Friday, on Mac Avenue Records. All right, here we go. Um, Song for Dub, a rec it's a song on the new record that I wrote for my uncle, who came from New York, came from uh, watching, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, the GUI is messing me up, I'm seeing everybody's messages here. Um, my uncle was born in, in Arkansas, and it was in World War II, and he came home, and he struggled with alcoholism, and eventually kicked it, you know, uh, by the time he was about 40, after having a great family, they all stood by him and ended up being um, uh, the president of Alcoholics Anonymous in Louisiana. His dad, my grandfather, was a Dixieland trombone player and was on tour playing in territory bands in the South uh, until my grandmother said, yo, you got to come home, you got two kids and another one on the way, which was my mom. So he became a band director in these little tiny towns in Arkansas and raised my mom to, to play whatever instrument he needed, right? So my mom was very talented, played lots of instruments. She met my dad at Dixie Band Camp in Arkansas uh, when they were about 14. And my dad was already playing music and interested in Bird and Charlie Parker and uh, you know playing jazz. And uh, they stayed in touch. They finally got married after my mom and dad went to college and they, they, uh, they ended up in Champaign at University of Illinois with a lady named Linda Anderson, Jerry and Linda Anderson. So they ended up moving down to Shreveport where the rest of the family was. I was born, my dad was always playing gigs and playing music around the house. Um, I got turned on to, uh, to jazz from my dad. Like I said, the biggest influence at that time was Thad Jones and Mel Lewis. I was a big band kid, walking in space, Quincy Jones. Then he brought home Made and Voyage by Herbie Hancock, and it totally took me to another, another place. I was a kid in, um, at home, locked, you know, in my room playing music, pretending, you know, like I was playing with these guys in the band. Uh, you know, I felt like I was playing with Tony, with Tony Williams myself. Um, so I was kind of a geeky kid. We ended up, in high school, we moved to the LA. My parents got jobs in Santa Monica uh, teaching music from Linda Anderson and Jerry Anderson. Uh, at that point, uh, I, was, I was going to high school uh, and 
I met um, Sean Halliburton. We had a band together. Sean Halliburton is John Clayton's cousin, younger cousin. So I kept hearing, he kept saying, yeah, my cousin's taking lessons from Ray Brown. John Clayton, oh, cool, who, you know? Now we all know what happened to John Clayton. Uh, Linda was an amazing choir teacher and she had a brilliant student named Jubilant Sykes. He's become a big opera star, classical, compo uh, classical singer, beautiful baritone. He's quite successful. He sings On Come Sunday from the new Monkster Plays John Beasley record. Um, that, I chose that song because I was, I was reading to kill, to kill a Mockingbird again and I was reminded how uh, the gospel church in a way, uh, you know, brings a sense of sanity and comfort to black American families that uh, um, go through so much crap during the week and maybe this is a healing thing and get them ready for their next week. So I kind of felt like I was scoring the movie when I wrote that arrangement. And there's Jubilant right there, full circle. When I moved to LA, I was accepted into the black community immediately. I was jamming at Mignongo, Daryl ja uh, Jackson's house uh, on Vernon. Uh, I was going to Carl Burnett, the great drummer. He had a workshop. This is before the world stage in Lemert Park hanging with Christy and uh, other young musicians like me trying to learn how to play. Billy Higgins was getting the world stage together next door. And uh, I always felt accepted. And I could go naming names forever. But, I, you know, I was playing with John B. Williams, great bass player. I was doing jam sessions at my house with Tony Dumas and Ralph Pinlin. Um, Kevin Brandon, great bass player. Bobby Bradford Jr., great saxophone player. Bobby Bradford's his, his father. And uh, so I was, I was going into the black community and never felt any kind of uh, awkwardness or racial tension. Uh, and it always struck with me that it was not the same if they came into my community. So um, I'm always reminded of that and I'm I'm in, always in debt to all those guys. I, I can't name them all right now because I've probably talked too much already. But anyway, um, so I'm learning how to play, you know, uh, in Lemert Park, South Central, all these great musicians, playing oboe in school. And um, I graduate and uh, uh, I meet Hubert Laws. Um, Hubert's always played, uh, He's always hired, you know, great young musicians. And um, um, he hired me and John Patitucci and Joey Heredia to go to, uh, to New York to play Carnegie Hall. My first gig in New York was in Carnegie Hall. I was about 19. Um, and I had turned down an oboe scholarship at Juilliard, so I, I might have been there already. But, you know, I was sort of a long, young punk you know, I was already gigging in L.A. with all these cats. I did not want to play oboe anymore. I was in the piano. So, um, uh, you know, I was already gigging with Ralph and John B. And I met Ndugu Chancellor, who's from my hometown, Shreveport. First time I met Ndugu, he said to me, because I was about 17, he said, I said, I said, hey, Ndugu, we're from the same neighborhood. You know, oh, Ndugu, we're from the neighborhood. Same town in Shreveport, Louisiana. And he said, not from my neighborhood. I love you, the Colonel. That's right. And Dugu. And we actually ended up doing a record called uh, Three Brave, Brave Souls much later um, before he passed away. It might have been his last record. Anyway, I started gigging with O.C. Smith, great singer, sang with Cal Basie. I was gigging at the Memory Lane, the Parisian Room. The Lighthouse, Concerts by the Sea, The Baked Potato, Dante's, all these clubs in LA at that time were burning, man. They were bringing, I saw Art Blakey, I could see anybody I wanted, anytime. Dexter, Hampton Hawes, Freddie, you name it, Tony Williams, Herbie, they all played at these clubs. And um, 
you know, uh, they were all, this was before the DUI and before, and before the home video, before the VCR. So LA was killing back then. So I had an opportunity to play in those places and, um, and listen, in a way, you know, uh, frankly, I didn't really need New York at that point because Joe Farrell was living out here. Freddie had moved out. Herbie had moved out. Wayne had moved out. Stanley Clark had moved out. Chick was living in L.A. Uh, Eddie Harris. I used to play gigs with him and Ronald. Eddie Harris. Bobby Hutcherson living in San Francisco. Tony Williams, San Francisco. Joe Henderson. I could go on and on. Hubert. So there was plenty of work, plenty of places to play. It was pretty awesome. I might have gotten lost in New York, you know. In fact, I probably would have. All those bad cats there. So anyway, I'm at, uh, I'm playing in New York with Hubert Lawson for the first time. And that's where I met John Patitucci. And um, later on, when we got back, I was playing at this place called The Comeback Inn in Venice. Now, John Clayton is from Venice. John and Jeff both. And uh, back then, Venice was predominantly a black community with a bunch of hippies living in it too. And this 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 uh, this gig was a was a hippie holdout. It was the worst vegetarian food in the world, but they let people play. And this is where I'd play there with Patitucci. I met Diane Reeves there for the first time. We were all just kids: Billy Charles, Larry Klein, Bob Shepard, and eventually Freddie Hubbard. And you know we're all friends to this day. Uh, Diane and I, Diane and I are. Diane and I are still very close. She sang, here's another full circle. She sings on volume, Munkister volume two, uh, Ruby, my dear. Bob Shepard plays the lead saxophone in the band, plays a bunch of solos. In fact, that's Bob playing an alto flute solo on song for dub. And I eventually followed Billy Childs in Freddie's band upon recommendation uh, by Bob Shepard, because he was playing with Freddie. Uh, and then Diane and I went on to play with, Di with Sergio Mendes' band, and I used to do her gigs, and played on quite a few of her records. Um, I spent about nine years playing with Freddie Hubbard, and that was really my college education, from about 21 or so until he stopped playing. Uh, again, that's where I met Chris McBride, Carl Allen, Ralph Moore, Penland, Roy McCurdy, Javon Jackson, John B. Williams, and I actually got to play with Elvin Jones for a week with Freddie. It's amazing. Full circle. Here we go again. Ralph Moore plays a great tenor solo on Come Sunday on the new Monkestra plays John Beasley record out Friday. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay. I got to speed up here, you guys. I got another 30 years ago. Um, it was Billy, Billy Childs, that turned me on to this amazing Sam Rivers record called Contours with Freddie and Herbie, I think Tony Williams, not sure who else. Anyway, I devoured that record so much that I, I have a tune on my new record called Sam Rivers with, with uh, John Patitucci. Full circle. John comes in and out of this story a lot. And Vinny Caliuta. So by this time, I was kind of starting to do sessions in L.A. Um, yeah, Abigail, you're right. I started doing sessions in L.A. and uh, doing gigs around town, of course, still. Uh, I'd met Vinny Caliuta, and we had this band called Audio Mind with Steve Tavaloni, a great saxophone player and programmer and Vinny and Gary Willis, great bass player. We used to improvise whole sets, which is unheard of, because this was the 90s when the LA Smooth thing was starting to come in. We were not that at all. And so we prided ourselves on, on being able to do that. And of course, because Vinny was in the band, all the stickheads, sorry, drummers, would come in and check him out, sit in the corner and, and you know stare at him while he played. He used to hate that. And one of those drummers, was Vince Wilburn, who was playing drums with, with Miles at the time, and was Miles' nephew. So he asked me to make a tape for Miles. 
And I was like, oh, okay. So I, I did what I did at the gig. You know, I, I put my, my cassette on, my HR-16 drum machine, had my sense and just kind of improvised for a little while. Gave it to him and thought nothing of it. I'm just gonna forget about this. So I'm in Florida on a gig and uh, Catalina calls me. She says, I think Miles Davis just called you. And I was like, mm, I don't think so. It's somebody playing a joke. Anyway, it was Miles. I called the number, he answered, and he said, you wanna join the band? And I said, are you sure? <laughs> uh, wrong answer, but ultimately he asked me to join the band and I went. And guess who was on that gig? Munyungo, full circle. Uh, so I'm out with Miles, you know, soaking it up. Uh, Catalina was pregnant with my daughter Sierra the whole time I was gone. Uh, but we all hung in there, um, um, and shoot, we'd be here for a couple hours if I told you all the things I learned about Miles. But basically I learned, and I keep re getting reminded about this over and over again, is to be true to yourself when you play. It's hard for a young musician to do, you know, because we're so enamored by Charlie Parker and Coltrane, and in my case, Herbie and McCoy, and, but it really is true. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing. There's other things, but like I said, we're running out of time. Get so, okay, here's a full circle. The keyboard player I replaced in Miles' band was 17-year-old Joey DeFrancesco. And I'm like, I'm hearing tapes of him shredding, you know, uh, playing like he, playing Jimmy, like, you know, he was 17, he's playing Jimmy Smith and Oscar Peterson stuff on a synth, it was bad. So over the years, Joey and I have always kept up. Last year he asked me to write big band charts for his record, um, Into the Universe. It's, ah, I'm gonna screw up the name of the record. His latest record. Um, um, so what a privilege. Full circle, he plays on the new record. Monkster plays John Beasley. He plays a, a ridiculous solo on Rhythm and Name. Um, so I get off of Miles' band, and I was writing a bunch of tunes um, at that time, inspired by Marcus and Amandala, you know, uh, uh, what was the other one? Um, Budi, Budi, the Tutu, right? Um, so Walter Becker, who had done sessions before, in the meantime, had uh, started a, a label on, on Wyndham Hill uh, called Wyndham Hill Jazz. So he, he produced my first two records. Um, and of course, Patitucci, um, Tavaloni, Erskine, it was the first time I played with Peter Erskine. My friend Ricky Minor plays on that. Ricky Lawson, Dean Parks, Bob Shepard again, Mignongo, Bill Summers, and Terry Lynn was living at the time in LA and we'd already become friends. So I recorded Steve-O, which is on the new record, uh, um, on the second record uh, that Walter produced called Chains of Heart. And uh, it's kind of different now, but uh, it's on the new record, and it's for my friend Steve Tavaloni, who's a total genius, bad dude. I still play music with him uh, on movies and stuff like that. Both Billy Childs, Full Circle, and Bob Shepard were on that label as well. We're also out on tour with Patitucci and uh, with Vinny, and uh, I think Gary Thomas was on this tour. We were opening for the VSOP band with Herbie, uh, Wallace Roney, God bless him, Wayne, uh, Ron, and Tony. This was what, mid 90s, or early 90s or whatever. We spent a couple weeks open, opening for those guys around Europe. And uh, uh, you know, night after night standing, getting our lessons, getting our heads handed to us, uh, but learning the whole time. This is sort of where I met Herbie and, and Wayne a little bit too. Um, we'll get back to that though. Um, in the meantime, I'd come home and uh, Walter was starting to get his solo record together along with Steely Dan. So I spent, I don't know, six weeks, six months in Hawaii um, with Walter recording, uh, was it 13 tracks of whack, something like that. They asked me to, uh, later on to join Steely Dan to be their musical director. So I spent 
um, I guess 94 to about 2000, touring and recording with those guys. Uh, another incredible learning experience and full circle because, um, you know, Walter had got me those early record deals. After that, I stayed home for a while. You know, I'd, I'd go out in the summer, but uh, L.A. had kind of turned into a, uh, a jazz desert, I used to call it. And I was sort of drifting. I was still doing a lot of studio work. I was working with Thomas Newman on a bunch of movies and writing commercials, uh, you know, playing on sessions with the Wojon brothers and um, learning how to write for studio orchestras, which came in handy, as you'll hear. Uh, my daughter, you know, was, was young, so I was home with her. I had a new marriage to Lorna Chu, um, who manages Monkestra. She's actually, Monkestra is actually her band. I'm just the musical director. Um, anyway, we've had an incredible ride. Uh, so I was kind of drifting a little bit. I met Charles Moore, a great trumpet player and teacher, who was working with Yusuf Latif. And uh, used to have Strata Records in Detroit. I don't know if you guys... Remember that label um, uh, with Kenny Cox uh, was was they were both you know uh, on that label had amazing musicians and great records from there. I'm supposed to hold this up. This is the new record out Friday the twenty first. Yeah, so um, I started hanging with 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 Bob and and Buzzy and Adam Rudolph and learning, listening again, and opening up, talking about phrasing, and listening to records together, and analyzing, and and, Bob, and Charles turned, uh, talked me into uh, recording Surfacing with Vinnie Calhoun on drums and Bob Hurst. And Bob had moved out to do the, the, do the Tonight Show, along with Tane, Kenny Kirkland, Ralph Moore, and, and um, Implication from the new record, Monkestra Plays John Beasley, is on that record. So that's a shout out to Charles Moore. Uh, and by that time, you know, Kenny was living out here in Tain, and we were all starting to hang out together and play music together. Uh, and, uh, you know, those were really fun days. Like I said, Ralph plays on uh, Come Sunday. Um, after that, there was a few more dry years. I was still working, but you know, the, the jazz desert had dried me up. Um, I got an opportunity to do a record, two records for Resonance Records. Um, one was called Letter to Herbie and another one Positively. This is a full circle story too. Um, so George Clavin, the, the, uh, the owner of that label, said, okay, I want, I want you to do this record, but I want you to do a tribute to Herbie Hancock. And I'm like, uh, that doesn't sound like a great idea for a pianist to do. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you want to get a trumpet player or somebody else to do that record, a drummer. So um, I, was, I, kinda, I said, no, I can't, I can't really do that. Um, um, by the way, I say Jazz Desert because the DUI and the VCR really wiped out all that, all that great live scene in LA. Uh, that's why I say that. Um, anyway, I go to this, this crazy camp the Caleb, what's Caleb's last name? Chapman. Caleb Chapman, sorry, <laughs> sorry Caleb, started in the middle of Utah. It was Ephraim, Utah, Snow College, um, where Carl Allen was doing stuff there with Juilliard. Anyway, they had Steinways in every practice room. It was kind of crazy. So um, I'm gonna have to hurry up. Uh, I start messing around in the practice room on a lunch break and f figure out a way to mash up um, Tell me a bedtime story in Maiden Voyage. So it clicked on me. He said, okay, I can, I can rework Herbie's tunes in my own way and not have the bullseye on my back. So I called him up. We did the record. I'd gotten to know Tane really well and, and McBride. They're on the record, full circle, um, along with Roy Hargrove. We did the next record in New York. I'd been living in New York for about eight months that time, by that time. And I kept going back and forth to New York a lot, too especially during the Steely Dan days, the Miles days. And we did, um, we did Positively with Benny Maupin, another one of my mentors here in L.A., um, Tane, and uh, we got a Grammy nomination for that. In the meantime, I started working on, on uh, 
American Idol, full circle with Ricky Minor. I was the head arranger and, and an assistant MD for all those, what, 13, 14 years. And uh, I learned Stabellius. And I started um, doing more MD gigs, uh, duets. Uh, I was working in Japan with this, with this artist producing records there with El Negro and Rabi Amin, Carlitos Del Porto, Yosvani Terry. It was a killing band, Brian Lynch. We'd be there three, four times a year touring and playing. Anyway, I got into Sibelius and another, you know, uh, I wanted to learn how to write Sibelius, so I picked Epistrophe. And um, well, lo and behold, man, I could, I could write a big band chart on Monk, and I figured out a way to sort of put my own voice in the Monk's music. And Monkestro was born at the Union Hall as a rehearsal band in LA. In the meantime, Diane Reeves recommend, recommended me to the Monk Institute um, replacing George Duke, uh, um, and George recommended me as well. And that sort of started me rejoining, that was 10 years ago, rejoining the jazz community, catching up with my old friends again, Diane and McBride. And uh, that led to International Jazz Day. And um, as a musical director, where I met Umas Kea, Umas Akea, and uh, got to be pretty good friends with him and inspired by him. That's why there's a tune called Masakea on this new record called Monkestra Plays John Beasley um, uh, out this Friday. And guess who plays on that track? John Patitucci and Vinnie Caliuta. All right, full circle again. And that's kind of where I got to know Wayne and Herbie a little bit more. And, and just being able to call him up and talk about the show led to all kinds of other things. I became a Nietzschean Buddhist. Uh, Benny Maupin and Buster Williams, both Shakabuku me, have been practicing ever since. And to getting to know Wayne was amazing because, uh, again, it was an affirmation to be yourself in your own music. So I wrote this tune called Be Beautiful for Wayne, and uh, Patitucci's on that, of course, and Vinny. Monkestra, since then, we've had, this is our third record, uh, four, four Grammy nominations. We're so proud of these guys hanging with us, um, being loyal. You know, <laughs> those guys aren't making any money, but they love playing the music. And um, um, uh, right now, I've got a Charlie Parker radio show on Sirius uh, called Bird and the Bees. That's what we've been doing since COVID. Um, and it's full circle back to Carnegie Hall because I was asked to write a commission for uh, the NYU, NYO Carnegie Hall Youth Band by Sean Jones. That should be coming out pretty soon. This summer I would have been touring in Italy with John Petitucci uh, this July. And in August, uh, starting gigs for my Charlie Parker project. Uh, Charlie Parker uh, with strings. Um, uh, Reimagined. We're not even doing the same songs, but we're kind of taking Charlie Parker's interest in classical music and large ensemble and taking it another place. And that's with my friend um, uh, Magnus Lindgren from Sweden, great a writer there. So we're sharing the writing. It's pretty cool. We would have been recording the record right now in Germany and then doing concerts in the fall, of course. Hopefully, maybe we will be able to do some of those. Um, and in that record, uh, and in the new record, actually, we pay homage to Charlie Parker with a, uh, an arrangement, a fresh arrangement on Donna Lee. Um, on this record right here, <laughs> John Beasley plays, uh, Monkestra plays John Beasley on Mac Avenue Records out this Friday. Sh couple shout out to some COVID heroes of mine, Thana Alexa and what she's done for her, her program for New York musicians, Adonis Rose, on Facebook Live, McBride is everywhere, Emmett Cohen, Ron Carter, back on the scene, man, big time. Doctors Without Borders, Lorna to Chew, doing COVID programs. Jeremy Pelt, thank you for the, the food posts. Mac Avenue, venturing out to the unknown, releasing records during the time of COVID. Anyway, uh, please be safe, please wear your mask so we can all go back to work and go to school safely, um, and be yourself. And thanks for listening.
Tchau.